and welcome to Confidently Compliant, a food safety podcast. I'm your host, Paula Parejo, and I'm from the BRCGS America's team. For those of you who don't know BRCGS, we are a GFSI recognized certification program that does food safety standards, but we also go beyond food safety. We have everything from consumer products to packaging to ethical and everything in between. And the one standard that we're going to be talking about today is plant-based, which will be released in January. Uh, with me, I have Jessica Burke. She is my colleague from the America's team. And today we're going to be talking about why plant-based is so popular and get to understand consumer trends and why companies are buying into it and why there's a standard. So thanks for joining me today, Jess, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too, Paula. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So how many people do you think are actually going to make a New Year's resolution to be plant-based this year? I'm going to say quite a few. Um, <laughs> it's a super popular um, diet and, and way of eating right now. So I think a lot of people are going to jump on the bandwagon. And um, that's essentially why we've chosen to write, write a standard about the plant-based uh, uh, diet. <clears throat> well, that does make sense. Um, before we get started, Jessica, could you give us a background of your history and how you're here today. Yeah, absolutely. So um, like many people that are in the QA and food safety world, I started off um, in the lab as a lab rat. Mm -hmm. um, so doing chemistry and microbiology testing on um, food and environmental samples. Um, so from there, I moved on to um, the food manufacturing industry mm -hmm. and in particular held uh, roles in food safety and quality assurance um, with Maple Leaf Foods. Um, and then from there, I moved on to Fortino's, uh, which is owned by Loblaw, actually. And uh, my role there was to implement SQF, um, which is a GFSI um, benchmarked standard, into our two manufacturing facilities. Um, so all of this um, sort of led me to where I am today and has allowed me to have the skills and, uh, and knowledge to do what I'm doing now, which is... Um, essentially oversight of the technical activities in the Americas for BRCGS. So no big deal, but you pretty much make the rules. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ever wondered the credibility of this podcast, I literally have the expert and rule maker right in front of me. All right. That's enough, Polly. You're making me blush. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so I thought, Jessica, that it would be valuable to get started with a definition of a plant-based diet. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically a plant-based diet is exactly the way it sounds. So um, it's a diet which is uh, reduced in meat or in some cases um, completely ex excludes meat or um, other products which could be made from animals. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an increase in plant-based foods. So um, for some people that could mean, like I said, just eliminating altogether um, and uh, having a vegetarian or a vegan diet. For some people, it just means reducing it, you know, to once a week or or reducing the amount of, of meat or animal products that you're, you're eating in a day. Um, so it's a very flexible diet. Um, and uh, that's why it's so popular right now. Okay. Here's a, here's a more specific question. What is the difference between a plant-based diet and a vegan diet? Because that sounds like the same. Yeah, and it's a fantastic question. It's something <laughs> that we get asked quite often. Um, so as far as uh, a vegan diet goes um, and just the vegan um, lifestyle in general, it's, it's very much just that. It's, um, it's a lifestyle choice um, and it's often driven by um, ethical and ethical beliefs and, and, um, and ideals. Mm -hmm. um, so... For example, somebody who is vegan, um, not only would they choose not to eat um, products that contain animal ingredients, they yeah. also won't, you know, wear um, clothing which has been um, made with animal animals like leather and, and whatnot, um, and also cosmetics. So any of the cosmetics that they choose obviously would be cruelty-free yeah. um, and wouldn't contain any ingredients that, that may be derived from, um, from animals. So even, you know, things like beeswax. Um, whereas plant-based it's, you know, although there could be ethical reasons behind somebody choosing a plant-based diet, mm -hmm. um, they're much more likely to be choosing it because of the, the health benefits, um, mm -hmm. that are associated with a plant-based diet. So less, less about the ethical reasons, more about the health reasons and what they're choosing to, to put into their body. That makes sense, but it could be both. So like, that's, that's good to understand. So we 
now see a lot of different companies coming up with meat alternative products or mm-hmm. dairy alternative products or egg alternative products. Um, I've seen it a lot in the grocery stores in the day to day, even just in the last couple of years, it's been, it's been growing so much. Mm-hmm. So my question to you is why such an increase in the plant-based product? Yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously brand owners are trying to get ahead of the the market, mm-hmm. um, the market trends. They understand that um, what their consumers want right now is plant-based products. So, you know, they can't continue to to operate and manufacture the same things that they've they've traditionally manufactured um, if that's not the direction that the market is going. So, you know, we've seen very large um, traditionally uh, meat protein mm-hmm. processing companies uh, moving towards um, plant-based products or just sort of adding that to their um, their offerings. Um, so so yeah, it, it's I, it's mostly just about trying to meet the the needs of the consumers. Um, so just to give you some perspective, um, in the past year, sales of plant-based products have actually grown by seventeen percent. Wow! Um, so that's a significant amount. Yeah. Uh, 8% of Canadians mm-hmm. and 6% of um, Americans actually are saying now that they are meatless. So whether that means mm-hmm. vegetarian, whether it means plant-based, um, they're they're saying, you know, we're, we're not eating meat anymore. Um, and, you know, considering the size of each of the, the nations, those are huge That's amounts. Huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we're seeing, we're seeing growth in, in other parts of the world as well. So, you know, China's is trending in the same direction, um, globally, the, the numbers are, are increasing everywhere and we don't see that changing. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Like, like any business, I guess you want to study your target market, get ahead of the trends, like, you know, jump on that wagon before Mm -hmm. your competitors do and be better at it. So that I can respect that. That does, that does make sense. I would like to recognize the motivations of the consumers for a moment. So why has plant-based grown to be so popular as a consumer trend? Yeah, so I mean, the the primary reason is that um, people believe that it it's a healthier way of eating. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been linked to decreases in heart disease. Yeah. Um, it's good for weight management. Um, it's been linked to decreases in certain types of cancer. Um, oh. cognitive decline. So, um, you know, people look at look at that and um, those are things people want for themselves. So, um, you know, primarily that's that's the reason. Um, there are some other some other reasons as well. Um, you know, environmental sustainability, yeah. animal welfare, um, but primarily it's the it's the the health effects that it has. I didn't know the cognitive one. Yeah. That's a neat one. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Cognitive meaning memory, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like, um, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, that kind of thing. Wow. Yeah. It's really, mm-hmm. it's really nice to hear. Yeah. Okay. And then of course, you know, the rise of um, social media, media. I mean, it's, it once something's sort of out there and being talked about, everybody sort of wants to be involved. So that's also obviously playing um, a big role as well. And then um, another thing I would mention is that um, allergies and intolerances mm-hmm. are becoming more prevalent. So um, some plant-based uh, diets or or foods can definitely help address these issues as well. So things like dairy, um, for example, and and uh, some of the other um, animal-based proteins wouldn't be included in in a plant-based diet. It's interesting that you mentioned social media. So in my personal experience, it's just like an average consumer, like social media is huge, Mm -hmm. absolutely huge Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of influencing people's diet trends and and ways that they should be living their lifestyles. It's quite trendy right now to be vegan or have a plant-based diet or meatless diet specifically. I think a lot of people find a sense of pride Mm -hmm. um, in being meatless because it's often considered a socially responsible way to eat. Um, I've certainly seen different posts or information on things that like eating a plant-based diet is actually an ecologically, ecologically, environmentally, (laughs) I knew what you meant, (laughs) an environmentally friendly option because it can help minimize your footprint or at least this is what I learned on social media. Absolutely. No, you're, you're 100% right. It's actually, um, you know, another one of the top reasons why people are choosing a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a sense of pride, as you said, um, around choosing a diet that supports sustainability and responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously people want to get involved in that. 
Um, and it's another reason why brand owners are um, getting involved as well. Um, obviously, they want to be su- seen as supporting uh, sustainability and, mm-hmm. and environmental responsibility. So not only are they um, reaching into the market, um, but yeah. they're, they're also supporting, um, supporting the other um, motivations. Wow. So you did mention that food safety sensitivities can be a factor mm-hmm. in why someone may choose a plant-based diet. So as a consumer, what is the best way to read packaging and be able to decipher if something is safely plant-based? Yeah, so this can be a really tricky one. Um, people need to become ingredient um, ingredient readers, basically. So they mm-hmm. need to flip over the package, look at what's listed on, in the ingredients um, and this can also be tricky because a lot of the ingredients that are are listed are some crazy words that you've never heard of. Pretty sure they're not even English. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and and sometimes they they don't sound like they would be anything that that you know would be a an an based on an, an animal derived ingredient. So yeah. um, it's it's just really confusing for consumers. Um, but it's really important to, to do that and do your research, know what the ingredients are, know what the different forms are. Yeah. Um, you know, luckily we do have some reputable um, certifications that are coming out now um, yeah. that have associated trademarks, which sort of takes the the confusion out of the picture for consumers. So they're, they're able to look at look at the package, look at the trademark and and trust that, you know, this this is what it says it is. When looking for a specific trademark, should you only trust those that say plant-based over vegan? No, not necessarily. Um, you know, we chose the term plant-based um for our standard because mm-hmm. it just meets meets our objectives and our our ideals. Um but that said, there are plenty of um vegan uh, societies out there, uh, which also have programs um, that they offer their trademarks to. So um, the important thing is understanding what sort of underpins the trademark. So, you know, what what does the trademark mean? What processes mm-hmm. and, and verifications are put in place to make sure that if they're claiming vegan or plant-based, that that's actually true. So it's, it's a matter of, of trust and confidence. What is the best way to understand which trademarks are the most trustworthy over other trademarks? Um, So there are a couple of different kinds of trademarks. Um, There are um, own brand trademarks or uh, self-declarations. And then there are also um, third-party trademarks. So um, one is not necessarily better than the other. It's just important to understand, again, what's beneath the trademark. So Mm -hmm. what underpins the trademark. Um, so what processes are are in place? Um, yeah. You know, what does the certification look like that that um, underpins that trademark? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is there a third party verification in, involved? Um, so, again, just sort of understanding what does that trademark mean, not taking it on on face value. That does that does make sense. I think that. It's, it's as a consumer, as a new brand owner, maybe someone who's new to the world, it can be difficult to decipher that and to understand like, what, where do I want to be? Do I want to be someone who's in this category or that category? I think it's really important that people take the time to learn what it means behind those trademarks, as you had mentioned. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it's really important, especially as a brand owner or as a manufacturing site, because you also want to decipher like, how do I want to present my options to my customers? Mm-hmm. As a manufacturing site or a brand owner, what are the key elements to finding a trustworthy standard for plant-based certification so that way they don't run into mislabels or any kind of liability issues? Yeah. Um, So essentially, a good standard is always going to take a management system approach. It's going to use a, you know, preventative approach um, in, in all of the... Um, the requirements uh, that, you know, right from supplier approval and ingredient approval, um, you know, through to product development, sanitation, um, you know, shipping and receiving. So it's it's essentially going to look at each step in the process mm-hmm. and take preventative controls to make sure that, or preventative measures rather, to make sure that the product that's coming out at the other end is truly free of animal ingredients and can be called a plant-based product. Okay. So does BRCGS 
specifically have a trademark for plant-based? Yeah, we do. Um, so for those of you that are listening, um, I'll describe the, the trademark. So it's essentially, um, it's circular mm -hmm. um, and it's got a leaf in the middle and on the top of, of the leaf, it says informed and on the bottom, it's, uh, it's got plant-based. So that's, that's what you're looking for. Circular, leaf, informed, <laughs> plant-based. Got it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's nice now that everyone has the chance to recognize the certification that suppliers work so hard to get. Mm -hmm. On that note, what are some manufacturing challenges suppliers should consider when thinking about developing a plant-based product? Yeah. So the key um, and the starting point for any plant-based product um, is obviously mm -hmm. the ingredients that are going to go into the product. So, um, you know, that's the first step, making sure that um, the ingredients that your suppliers are providing to you um, are actually free of, of animal ingredients. And mm -hmm. again, that takes a lot of, of research and understanding what those suspect ingredients will be, um, getting the assurances from suppliers that they will continue to meet your requirements, and then, of course, doing constant you know, verification of, um, of the ingredients, yeah. whether they be um, you know, routine verifications for, for ingredients that... Um, are regularly supplied or if it's, you know, for a new product and, and it's a new ingredient that's coming in the door, it's, it's really important to just make sure that, that that's the first thing that's taken care of. Um, and then for sites that produce um, foods that y they could produce plant-based foods and um, animal products as mm -hmm. well um, can be, can be a, a particular challenge in that um, cross-contamination becomes an issue. So, Again, right from the beginning. So when you um, bring the ingredients in the door, you want to make sure that you're following segregation procedures um, and then all the way throughout the process. So making sure that, um, you know, when if you're using the same line that you are uh, doing a full sanitation in between, mm -hmm. doing some verification after the sanitation. Um, of course, employees play play a big role. Um, so, you know, the movement of employees, um, our employees going from one line to another. Um, and then, you know, of, of course, the most important thing is getting buy-in from the employees and from senior management. So everybody needs to understand, you know, why the claim's important, why yeah. the processes and the procedures that are in place are important. Mm -hmm. um, and they need to, to commit and support that. On the point of cross-contamination that mm -hmm. you had mentioned, so with plant-based... Would it be as strict of protocols for a site to follow as it is with gluten-free because of the options with allergens? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, es essentially, the the procedures ve are, are very reflective of what you would find in an allergen control program. So yeah. it's all of the things that you would normally do, like um, the ingredient approval, the segregation, mm -hmm. um, you know, the sanitation in between or scheduling if it's, if it's around scheduling. Um, so it, it's all of those same, those same requirements are involved in, in producing a plant-based product. Interesting. So what are the risks of developing a plant-based product and not getting certified? I just kind of want to understand the severity. I mean, like, if, if you're food safety certified specifically, like don't those go hand in hand with plant-based? Like why bother getting the other certification when you already have one? Right. So obviously food safety is number one and that's, you know, definitely your starting point. Mm -hmm. um, plant-based certification is all around um, brand protection and reputation. So, you know, that, um, that gelatin that has just gone accidentally into a plant-based product could be 100% safe and nobody's, right. you know, going to gonna, gonna um, get sick from a food safety perspective, but it's yeah. going to be an issue for that person who is um, avoiding um, any ingredients that, that contain animal products um, for whatever reason. And guaranteed that person's going to make a fuss about it. They're going to go on social media. They're going to, you know, complain to to whomever. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's just not worth your reputation. Um, so, so that's why a plant-based certification is, is important. That's logical. I think that's a very important distinction of being safe versus being plant-based. Like, yeah. of course the two are encompassing. You want to be safe if you're plant-based, but like that just, that main example you gave with the gelatin, like mm -hmm. if I were plant-based, I'd also be upset. Right. Risky business. If 
if you don't make the distinction um, very clearly, like that you're plant-based. If I were someone who was plant-based or trying to be plant-based and I saw a label and it's like, oh, plant-based and there's gelatin in it, of course I'd make a fuss on social media. It's not even a question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like like why, why even bother risking your reputation at that point? Like I think, I think that's a really good distinction to understand. Something can be safe, but it's not necessarily plant-based. And that's the reason why you should consider if you're going to get into plant-based products to have that particular certification. Because if you can put a label on it, what more... Like, but what better to protect your brand or at least promote your product mm-hmm. than to do that? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, why risk your your reputation? It's just not worth it. it um, you know, once you've lost the trust of your customers, it's difficult, if not impossible, to get it back. So, you know, whether your um, whether your customer is a supplier, whether it's mm-hmm. a specifier, uh, whether it's a, it's a consumer, um, it's just so important that you don't take. Um, label claims and mm-hmm. in and declarations lightly. I think that might be a very good point also, like of having a specific process like this through a certification program over self-declaration. I know that it's a personal preference, but I mean, at least if you have the processes to back you up, like you can always go back to the standard and get that clarification yeah, or get that absolutely. support over self-declaration. Mm-hmm. So it's It's certainly something to really think about as a brand owner or as a manufacturing site. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, can you tell me what the key highlights of the BRCGS plant-based standard are? Um, What it essentially covers and how it helps you ensure compliance? Yeah, for sure. Um, So so it is a management system approach. Um, Mm -hmm. It does take a preventative um, approach in controlling ingredients um, that contain uh, animals. So yep. um, controlling that throughout the process, again, from all the way from supplier approval and the ingredients going into the product. And then at every step of the way, there is some sort of control in place and verification mm-hmm. to ensure that that control um, is working. Um, so obviously this helps to make sure that whatever's you know coming out at the end is something that you can trust, that consumers can trust, and that we can put we can put that plant-based claim on. Okay. So let's say a brand owner is listening to this podcast and their interest is piqued. Um, they don't want the liability, but want to claim that their product is a legitimate plant-based product. So how do they go about um, getting their manufacturing site certified? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, first step, which is always a good step, is visit our, our BRCGS website, mm-hmm. um, contact our, our sales team, and then our sales team can sort of help um, help put you in the right direction. Um, things like downloading the standard itself, which yep. um, outlines all of the requirements. Um, and then uh, we also have a self-assessment tool, which can be used to sort of do a gap assessment um, mm. of your own facility so that you can look at the standard requirements um, and then uh, identify which areas you may need some work on, if any. Um, and then once you feel that your, your site is ready, um, that's when you would contact a certification body, um, and start to, to look at scheduling your audit. And then once the audit take, takes place yeah. and any nonconformities are closed out, um, you're officially certified. And at that point you're, um, you're allowed to use the, uh, the official plant-based logo on your, your products. The self-assessment tool. Is that free? Yeah, absolutely. It's free? hmm Yeah. That's so helpful. Yeah, for sure. It, it's, uh, you know, it's a great tool for you to be able to take into your own facility. Mm-hmm. Um, it lists all the requirements of the standard and then gives you a spot where you can um, sort of go in and put your own comments, um, mm-hmm. you know, enter, you know, where you think you need you need help or, or where you need to strengthen your program. Yeah. And then you can sort of use that as your your tool to get to get started in terms of implementing any uh, any processes for gaps that you might have. Okay. So if you're new to the industry and you want a little bit more support or information on how things just work and and all that kind of stuff, like does BRCGS provide anything for you as a newcomer or part of a community? Yeah, I mean we've got um, we've got all kinds of stuff on our website. We've got the the quick start guide for plant based. Mm-hmm. That sort of um, gives you the outline of here's where to start, and it's sort of like a roadmap on on how to become certified. Um, and then of course, you know, talking to somebody is always probably the easiest and, and best thing that you can do. So, yeah. you know, we're always available um, through email um, and then we, we can have a conversation as well. 
So we, we'll hold your hand through the entire process. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. I think I think some people will need that sometimes. But if you're a little bit more independent, then at least you can uh, just come to our website. Mm-hmm. So for those of you who might not know, our website is www.brcgs.com. And if you're interested in looking at the plant-based standard, you can find some information on there. And you could always reach us at contact us at brcgs.com as well. So Jessica, thank you so much for taking the time to come in today and chat with us a little bit about plant-based, educating us on the definitions and consumer trends. And I hope this was helpful for anyone listening who are considering plant-based. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. And I hope I was able to shed a little bit of light on the plant-based world. I think you did. I think you did. Um, So for those of you listening, again, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, Please remember about the Food Safety Americas Conference. It's in May 2020. Um, May 12th to 14th. You guys can get your tickets online. Go to the BRCGS website as I had listed and get your tickets from there. Let's use science for a safer world and let us help you meet compliance confidently. Mm -hmm.